So uh, we want to kind of have an open forum. We like to get up here every year, every other year, sometimes twice a year, just to hear from our different communities. And that means not just down in Medford or Ashland or Phoenix and Talent to come out to Rouge. You guys are just as important as any part of our district. So we want you to know that by coming out here. And uh, it's a nice drive out anyway. We enjoy it. And stopped in Jackson and had a great snack before it came out. So it's, it's, always a, it's always fun to come out here. I was actually concerned we might have a forest fire out here somewhere and I could be closed down the boy. Don't even mention it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 If you notice, I've got some funny markings on my hands here before you ask. I spent yesterday redoing my uh, deck. <coughs> Just like anybody else, I had to sand it down. And, well, before it fell down, I had to sand it down and put three layers on it so it's back in one piece. So, uh, that's just paint, folks. It's not some weird thing I've been doing. Peter? <laughs> <laughs> well, good evening. I, I, my name's Alan Bates. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I'm Peter Beckley. I'm your state representative. I'm happy to be with uh, our state senator, Alan Bates. Great to be out here tonight. And uh, what I thought we'd do is what we usually do in the in town hall. We just kind of let, let you know a little bit what we're working on and what we're seeing uh, for the next year or so. Uh, and Bates usually lets me go first. I do the stream of consciousness stuff, and then he makes sense of it afterwards. Uh, and then, then we, we can have a, a, a Q and A on, on any issue you want to bring up, uh, having to do with our area, state government, and what we're all about. So uh, it, it's okay, Doctor, for me to, to start this up. Well, like we usually do. Okay. Um, so um, when last we met, uh, <laughs> the the last year or so has been incredibly active. Uh, the uh, 2013 session, uh, from our point of view, was very successful in, in many regards. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about budget. I'm going to try not to get your eyes rolled back in your heads when I talk about budgets. But, but both of us are focused uh, to a huge extent on the state budget and what we're doing with the budget. So in a nutshell, what we attempted to do and to a great extent succeed in 2013 was start to turn the corner, particularly on education funding. That's been a priority for us for a long, long time. So uh, we got into the session in 2013 uh, with uh, uh, some significant challenges uh, to get through, uh, and we worked through them. We were able to put a, a billion dollars more resources into K-12 in the 13-15 budget than we had in the 11-13 budget. And that was, a, that was a huge push. It was a priority for many of our colleagues as well, and we got that done. It, what it does, to be really brutally straight about it, it gets K-12 almost back to where K-12 was before the recession, but not there yet. We're not there yet. So a lot of the work that we did was to, to try to get the resource into K-12 because we knew statewide we had to stop laying off teachers, we had to stop cutting days of schools, we had to start adding programs to that, an absolute priority. So that was the biggest focus of the session, at least from for my perspective, and we did get that accomplished. A couple of very important things that, that were part of that work, one was uh, reforms in the public safety sector. The budget, the state budget, 93% of the budget is education, public safety, and health and human services. That's 93% of the state budget. So if you're going to invest more in education, you've got to find a way to hold down costs in the other two major budget areas. This guy has been at the forefront of the health care efforts to hold down costs. He'll give you a little bit of the information on what we've been able to accomplish in terms of stopping that rapid increase in health care costs every year. We've been very successful at it. You hear a lot about the darn website, uh, but uh, if you put the website over here to talk about what we're actually doing in health care, uh, it's a tremendously positive story to tell. More Oregonians having access to health care, getting better results at a lower cost, which is tremendous. I'll let Bates go into detail on that. On the public safety side of things, we work with the Pew Institute for the States and try to go after evidence-based reforms of our public safety system. And interestingly enough, there's a similarity in all these major areas. In healthcare, one of the reasons we've been able to get really good results, and uh, Bates really kind of does help design this, uh, this method of healthcare delivery, was by giving resources back down to the local level and coordinating the care on the local level. That's the, the, the gist of the coordinated, coordinated care organization uh, plan we helped develop. We, we did the same thing in public safety. We basically looked at the public safety sector and said, we can no longer afford, we can't build another prison, we can't afford to build another prison. We can't just have this system go on and on where we're getting 
kids in the pipeline who are dropping out of school, getting in trouble, going to the Oregon Youth Authority, getting in more in trouble, and then end up going to the Department of Corrections and costing a fortune to the state as our, as our incarceration costs kept increasing and increasing. We were at a point that if we did not stem that tide, we were going to have to build another prison in Junction City, which would have cost the state about $600 million uh, for the rest of this decade to build that and staff that prison. So we knew we had to put a stop to that. So working with the Pew Institute, we tried to do the same sort of reforms in public safety as we did in healthcare. We tried to say if we push money back down to the local level and we get coordinated efforts on a variety of, of, of programs, everything from community correction programs, Oregon Youth Authority programs for kids, working with the K-12 system, working with our foster care system, which Bates might want to talk about as well, can, can, can we can coordinate our efforts to keep kids out of that pipeline? Can we turn around the, the flow of people into our prisons and hold down those costs? And we're successful at doing so. so you'll, you might hear in the next couple of months um, some interesting interpretations of what we did uh, because we did change some sentencing laws. Anytime you change a sentencing law, you have old people will stop and they'll say you're soft on crime and look what you did. You're letting violent criminals out on the street, which is not true, but those, those things will come out because people like to, to pound that drum. But what we did do was get more resource to the local level held back on the Department of Corrections budget so that we could invest more in education. And we did in K-12. And we also invested more in early childhood education. We did not succeed on, on the higher education by any way, shape, or form. We are, so, we are still very far behind in community college funding and higher ed funding from where we were prior to the recession. We still have a ways to go on that, and we're paying a price for that. So my priority for 2015, my priority is how do we now continue that work and start to invest, hold the line, and increase our investment in K-12 and our childhood, but, but reinvest in higher education so we can get back to where we were prior to the recession and start to build the state because I passionately believe that the best economic engine we have is education. And if we fund education in our state, that's the economic engine that makes it work and go. So that's my spiel, that's my framework because I spend so much time in budget world. Uh, there's other, a bunch of other issues that came up down there. Working on the PERS issue was tremendously hard. I'd be glad to talk about that. Working on medical marijuana dispensaries took way more of my time than I ever thought it would. Uh, that, that became an issue. Working on GMO issue uh, took a lot of our time uh, in, uh, in, in Salem. Uh, the effort from, uh, um, from many people to, to, uh, to preempt Jackson County's ability to vote. Um, there, we can tell stories, but uh, we probably get in trouble <coughs> telling those stories. Well, this, <laughs> unless Bates wants to, it, or unless you guys want to talk about it, I'd be glad to talk about that. In addition to higher education, uh, the, a major push that we have to make, I am actually working to try to get the organic farm industry, because it is industry in our state, uh, further organized. So organized and do great work, we need to take it up to a next step, a next level of organization statewide, because we have great products in our state, and we should be very proud of these products that you're selling them locally, selling them outside of our state as well. So that's part of the effort I want to work on in the next session as well. So that was my spiel, and I took, I don't know, eight minutes? Yeah, we've all waited now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Peter and I really agree on all the basic issues we work on, so you're not going to hear a lot different from me, but maybe just a little different way. Um, the reason I, I go up to Salem, the reason I ran for this office, is, is to try to make Oregon a better place to live. And I really mean that. That's, that's the real reason we, I went up there. You know? We go up there, we get paid, what, 20000 a year? 22000 20, oh, 20, <laughs> We leave our families for six months. And uh, we go up there because we both want to make our homes and our communities and our state a better place to live. Historically, over the last 10, 12 years, our state has been a recession. We had a recession in the early 2000s. We never really came out of that. The rest of the country did. And we just rolled right into not, not what I call a recession, a true depression. If you look at the numbers, it's the same as the 1930s. And our job for the last 10, 12 years was just to hold the thing together. We weren't building anything new. We were just trying to hold programs together so that we didn't have a collapse in our state in education and child welfare uh, and all the things we try to do to make this a better community to live in. I think we were reasonably successful in doing that, although we made terrible cuts to K-12 and to higher education uh, and to child welfare. And all those things we were trying to do, hopefully together, were partially successful. Last session was the first session of the 14 I've been up there, 14 years I've been up there. 
where we actually had an opportunity to start rebuilding our communities. Mm -hmm. And that's what the extra billion dollars for K-12 was. Peter led the charge on that and we all supported it. It was the most important priority we had. We had to do the K-12 before we do anything else. <clears throat> but we can lose sight of something else also when we think about this. All the programs and things we do and things that are, make up our community are really intertwined, deeply intertwined, more than you think about. You start pulling one thing out and prioritizing it, you lose something over here. And I want to talk about this a little bit because this is where I'm going to be going in the next session. Uh, my first goal in the last eight, nine, ten years was to bring universal health care to the state of Oregon. And with the federal changes and things we've done locally, you basically have done that now. Uh, everybody in this state, all kids, absolutely all children now have health insurance. And most adults do too. There's a few still don't, but they have opportunities to get that if they wanted to. So I kind of think of that as something we've done and we don't want to lose it. We want to maintain it. We want to institutionalize it, but we don't want to lose it. But now we can move to other things. And this is intertwined with other things also. Children don't do well in school if they're sick. People can't get work if they're sick. People can't do the things we want them to do if they're sick. So that's the first step in trying to build a better, a better community and a healthier population. We've also done it in a way to save money. Uh, those of you who buy prime premiums in health insurance today have noticed your premiums go up 10, 12 percent, 15 percent every year, year after year after year. There's lots of reasons for that shift to the people who don't have insurance and a whole bunch of other reasons. We had to stop that. So for the last two or three years, we've seen increases of, that are about the same level as inflation, two or three percent. And we believe the next year we're going to start seeing those go down to inflation or below as we start saving more money in the healthcare fields, primarily through CCOs. We'll talk about them just for a second because we've worked on this for eight or nine years to get this to happen and we finally got it done last time. And it's a model for what we can do in the rest of state government. We used to have a healthcare system that said, uh, if you're physically ill, uh, we have a system for you. And you go see your doctor, your nurse practitioner, you go to the hospital, you go to the emergency room. We had a separate system if you had mental health problems that didn't talk to the system. By law, couldn't. And we had another system that took care of drug and alcohol problems over here. And by law, you couldn't talk to the other two systems. So they were actually laws that you cannot share the information on a patient across those different areas. And they all had separate budgets. They all duplicated a lot of what they did. And it was just a mishmash. It was just Byzantine. And we actually finally broke all that up and said, we're going to have local organizations that will be responsible for mental health, drug and alcohol, physical health, and social issues at times in one budget local. We call those coordinated care organizations that are localized. We have two in our county and there's 16 all over the state. They have been incredibly successful in driving costs down in their first year only. And when you look at things like readmissions of hospitals, amount of usage of the ER for the population, those are dropping by 10 to 15 percent. And that's where you save the money. So this has really been a great thing I'm looking forward to doing and continuing. When we look at other parts of healthcare, uh, <clears throat> outside of the CCLs, we don't see those kind of changes occurring. And now we're trying to talk to commercial insurers about coming into CCOs. We run uh, just about the largest uh, insurance company in the state outside of the CCOs. It's called uh, a system that we, put, we insure our public employees with. We're moving them into CCOs next year. There's huge savings there that we can then move over to other areas, such as K-12, higher ed, and those types of things. My main thing I'm going to be working on the next time we go up there is what I call a poverty initiative. If you want to see who's going to fail in school, look what they're at in the first grade, how many of them can read and can't read. You can pick out the ones there. One of the stories I always tell is before I stopped doing OB in 2001 when I went to the state legislature, I delivered about 3,000 kids. And that's a lot of kids. I don't remember many of them because they're you know, kind of blurs, you know. <laughs> you come up, remember the blurs of And I say, yeah, 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 yeah no. <laughs> and, um, but you deliver those kids, and then uh, because I'm in family practice, I got to see those kids grow up. And I'm thinking, looking at now third generation kids. And I can just about predict at the time of delivery, what that child's life is going to be like as far as education level, success, and difficulties with the crime system by knowing the voters. And as that 30 years rolled out, I was probably right about 95% of the time. And that's just really sad. The teachers in the room will probably agree with what I'm saying, I guess. So how do you break through that poverty issue? 
We have about 15 or 16 or 17 programs to deal with poverty in our state, and they don't talk to each other at all. Okay? We have programs for getting kids ready for K-12, but they don't talk to each other. Last session, we began bringing them together like we had brought together things for the CCOs and putting them in one place and saying, you guys have got to talk to each other and start moving in the right direction because what this is about is the children. It's not about you know, the agencies and the rest of it. It's about the children and bringing them together and making this thing work better. So we're just starting on that path. We're going to work very hard on it the next session. And it may sound pretty simple, but these things are not simple. You have a lot of competing agencies, people who feel, feel very strongly about their program versus the other program. They get them to cooperate, sit down, and talk to each other. It can sometimes be difficult because they're all doing good things and they're afraid of giving something up and losing what they're doing and losing the whole thing. And you've got to convince them that as a group, we've got to do better. Because if you look at the statistics, there's been no significant change as far as poverty in the state, except for some worsening in some areas in the last 30 years. And we've got to break through that. There's no reason for that to continue. Every kid should hit the first grade ready to learn and capable of learning. I mean, we've had long discussions about this, but the fact is it still hasn't happened. I'll give you one last example of this and we'll stop it so people can talk. Um, we have a foster care program in this county that most of us kind of vaguely know about. Um, my, my attitude about foster care was if, if you're a parent and you treat your child so poorly that they're going to go in the foster care system, the best thing you can do is pull that kid out get that kid in a safe place and never let them have any of those parents again, those terrible people. Um, and I had that attitude for a long time, probably for some anger, some things I'd seen as a doctor and some deaths I'd seen. And, and I just, you know, that was where I was. And uh, Rita Sullivan and some other people here in town, after pounding on my, you know, thick head for two or three years, convinced me that I was wrong, that about half those families, the worst thing you can do for those children is separate them from their parents. That parental connection loss is the worst thing that happens to those kids, and you're doomed them to the failure. If you look at how kids end up in the foster care system and what happens afterwards, 40% of the boys end up in prison, and about 20% of the girls end up in prison, when the national average for women in prison is like 1 or 2%. We I mean, just dump them out the street at age 18 after running them through the system. So, Rita Sullivan put together a program which broke down the silos for foster care. She brought school officials together, judges together, the health, the DHS system together, the Department of Human Services, the uh, health care people, and the police and said, we're going to select about half the families we believe that do not uh, belong in the category of separation. You can actually keep these families together, but we have to give them very special services. We're going to give them housing. They're going to have 24-7 counseling and supervision for two or three years as a family. We're going to take care of their mental health, drug and alcohol problems, we're going to make sure they're back in the workforce, the parents are, and we're going to watch those kids very carefully. And she's done it for about five years now. The result is this. We used to average 440, 450 kids a month in foster care in this state, I'm, just, I'm sorry, this county. That number is now 250. Mm -hmm. And it stays there. There are some, like I said earlier, some families, you just, they're so dysfunctional and so much trouble they can't do it. By bringing all these different groups together, and setting this program up, uh, we've cut the foster care roles in the state, of this county, I'm sorry, by half, okay? Mm -hmm. Those kids have been followed now for five or six years. They're doing well in school. They've done some very simple things. The kids have to stay in the same school for the entire year. Parents can't move every two or three months. They gotta stay um, drug-free and alcohol-free, and they have to be uh, in counseling the entire time. So it's a five or six year program, but you can actually turn those families around by bringing all those processes into one place and making it happen. So last session we took it up to Salem and convinced people there that we should do this statewide. And that program is now rolling out statewide. Mm -hmm. Judges are being taught that you don't have to break families up, you have to select them put them into this program. Social workers are understanding a different way of approaching these families. Uh, the education system is learning. We want to keep these kids in the same school. I mean, these kids were commonly changed schools three or four times a year. They, are, they, can't, they can't possibly do that. And that would happen year after year after year. So we're working on those issues, and I think breaking things down, breaking down silos and bringing things together like we did in the CCLs, like they're doing in, in, the, in foster care, is the way we're going to go forward and really make a change in our society and bring these strings together and have something that actually works and makes us a healthier society. 
that will lead to the rest of the things we're looking for. It will bring more jobs in because when we talk to jobs, we talk to job groups and talk to, to employers, they want a well-educated workforce. That's what they want. Uh, they want a safe place to raise families. They want a good school system. They want a good environment. All the things we all want. If you can't get there, if 40% of your population is in poverty, dysfunctional, on drugs, on alcohol, and due to crime. So we've got to break through all that and start changing our society. I believe we can do it. And that's what I'm going to be working on primarily next session. And I'm willing to give up some of my money. <laughs> your money. From it's your money. It's my money. <laughs> from from uh, health care that we've saved and put it over in, into your part of the budget for higher ed, K-12, and, uh, and, and free, free uh, K-12 programs. Okay. Not all. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you. It's very kind. Of well, I, I do have the largest single budget, right? You do have the largest. About twenty-two billion dollars. So, if we can slice some of that out of there, save it, and send it to places where I think it'll do a better job, that'd be great. It's, it's vital. It is vital. So I'm going to stop there. I'm glad I haven't bored you terribly. And I want to give you sort of a sense of what we're doing. So I wonder if both of you could speak to what kind of initiatives or programs you might see to get uh, businesses and jobs and getting the um, economy moving from that side. Certainly they need skilled workers, but you also need uh, companies and businesses, corporations who are willing to pay their fair share and offer internships and participate in this um, improved society. Peter and I, well, you can start by finish. Peter and I had a, um, Town Hall just on that issue a couple of weeks ago, and, and Peter Sherwood would hurry, and I'll, well, I'll fill in some you know, it, it's, it's fascinating, you start to see these patterns repeat themselves over and over again, similar to the fact that we've had all these different programs in the health area and trying to get them coordinated moving forward. We've had, in, in public safety as well, in workforce development, we, we have so many different tools we try to use, and the coordination of them has not happened. And I think that we're at that tipping point now where that is starting to happen to the point where there's tremendous pressure. I mean, our Rural Community College does a very good job in their outreach and their, their proposals they've got going forward. And they have their Allied Health Initiative, which is, which is I think, really employer-driven and student-driven as well. Um, we're going to need to we're working with SOU to kind of open up SOU a little bit more, too, to that kind of relationship. It's going to take that kind of comprehensive, coordinated effort to train the workforce uh, that, that's needed uh, to, for jobs here. And trying to be very smart about what we have. We have a healthcare industry here. We have an organic farming industry here. We have an education industry here. We have culture here. We, we take the, the, the strengths that we have, build on the strengths that we have, and do it in a coordinated way. Uh, particularly in regard to making sure we have a pipeline as kids leave high school or community college or the university, that they have, they have a more connection with what's available in the community, and that the businesses have more connection as well with the education programs. Uh, we funded career and technical education programs. But in fact, one of the most uh, fun projects to work on the last couple sessions has been your career and technical education and your shop programs, you know, and, and your, uh, you know, everything, uh, your culinary uh, programs, uh, beautician programs, everything that has to do with career and technical education. Um, we've started to fund a program again to get these back into the schools. And I tell you, that's the easiest vote I think I've ever had to get for my colleagues. It's like, you know, it's like it's past 60 to nothing in the House, 30 to nothing in the Senate. And their only complaint is, why didn't you give us more for this? Because people want it back in their schools. And we're seeing, we're on a path now, we can get career and technical courses back in every district in the state by 2020 if we maintain the pace that we're on. Let me answer that a little more quickly. Some of the other points, too. What we heard pretty clearly was there are jobs available here in the in the county that are going unfilled because we don't have the workforce that is, that is trained for those particular jobs. Uh, RCC has been trying to work in that direction. Uh, OIT has actually helped out a great deal, too. Uh, Southern Oregon University, I think, is getting ready to make this big shift. I think we've been talking to them for years about it. And they are really thinking we have to engage in our community. Uh, we can't just be a liberal arts school. We'll, we'll maintain that. But it's time for us to make the shift into producing the kind of workers people need and, and offering education for people who live here that want to back out the workforce. Uh, I probably shouldn't do this, but she's not here. So my wife is is um, is a, I'm actually dating a co-ed. <laughs> <laughs> I admit she's older than most of her professors, but she's a co-ed. <laughs> and, uh, 
And she reached a point in her in her career that without a bachelor's degree, she had two-year degree and, and stopped and started raising kids and all, um, putting up with me. Uh, and so she didn't have a chance to get her education. So she's now doing, she's a junior, she's finished her junior year, she's a senior this fall, and complete her degree in, in uh, business management at SOU. That's the kind of things that really open up jobs. She'll go back to work and she's going to go up the career, career ladder now after that. So we have to do those kinds of things. So it's, it's, it's lining that up. The other thing we heard was this internship situation. Um, a lot of businesses would like to open up internships to high school students and college students and teachers and have them come into their business and see what actually happens there so they can be better at it. One of the reasons they don't do it is because they need liability protection. And I, did, I had not heard that. I mean, you go to these things, you hear things that you hadn't heard before. We're going to have to work on that in the next session. We need liability protection so you can be a 15, 16, 17 year old or older intern somewhere for two or three months. And if something happens, we don't want to put people in dangerous positions, of course, but if something were to happen, something simple there, they don't want to get sued. So they say, no, we won't do it. So we have to have some kind of simple program that allow them to have some, some lack of liability so they can get in there and start those programs up. You hear a little thing like that that really makes sense to me. The other thing I heard, and it wasn't at the forum, but I'll throw it out there. I was talking to uh, Ordering Business Incorporated, which the, is a, it's the group that we use in the state to try to bring businesses into the state. They're going to take a little different tact now. We, we brought a guy in from uh, Milwaukee who has done this back east. And said so the way you build more businesses is you go to the businesses you've already got. You sit down with them and you find out who their suppliers are. Then you go to their suppliers and get them to move to Oregon. That's, and that's a very subtle way of really bringing in a lot of people. They've already done move one country, one company of 30 or 40 people from Modesto, California, up into I think it was the Salem area. They were always supplying an outfit up there. And they said, "Why don't you move up here?" And they said, "Well, nobody asked." And they helped move up. They're in there now, and they're going to follow that same thing. We have a lot of surprising small industries all over the county because we don't necessarily hear about a lot of manufacturers. We need to go to them and say, who's your supplier? And go to that supplier, and many of them are in California, and move them up. And maybe it's only 30 or 40 jobs. That's a big deal to us. If you give me 30 or 40 jobs, and you give me 10, 15 companies with 30 or 40 jobs, that's a big deal for us. They can really make us a, a more viable place for people to live and work. So I hope I've answered you. If I could have one more thing with you. Overkill in every answer, I'm sure. But we started a program uh, in 2011 called Grow Oregon. And uh, there's a, a professor at the uh, SAU named Rick Holt uh, who wrote a book on economic development. And he really focused on this idea of economic gardening the idea that you take existing businesses and, you, and just as Bates was saying with, with the vendors, you say, What would you need to expand by three or four employees or two employees? And you work with companies on that level. And this is a, you know, we funded it with something like $250,000. It was a small kind of pilot project. But we found that by working with companies one on one like that, uh, we were able to create jobs at, a, at an average of $34,000 per job created, full time jobs created. And we have it as well. So we're going to try to scale that up now, that effort, because it makes sense to people. People love the small businesses in their area, and we can help the small businesses grow. It's a good thing. Does the state have anything to do with the food that is served in schools? We have the Farm to School program, which we began in 2007 as a pilot, and we've started to expand it. So we, we have this relationship with the federal government because the feds have their requirements in terms of who they contract with. So we still get out-of-state food in our schools. Uh, but we can, we can, if we choose to, pay a little bit more. Isn't this weird? We pay a little bit more and we use local. Uh, so, so. Let, me, let me give you a little more insight that maybe help you. Is that yeah. okay? Yeah, you bet. Um, we spent 10 years on a school board and um, and uh, each district kind of makes up its own decisions about what they, where they buy the food, where they get the food from, whether they have their own servers or not. Um, I, I uh, made a big effort at that point to, to get more organic food, better food. Uh, less processed food, less fast food, um, and it didn't go over well. This is back in the 90s. But I think things are changing. I think people are realizing now it's time to get good food to our kids. You know, and, I mean, we used to have pizza almost every day in that, in that cafeteria, and Pepsis, and uh, Diet Cokes and stuff. And we started moving that stuff out. Kids are used to eating that kind of food and like it. Um, 
and it's going to take some time to convince them to eat more vegetables, to, uh, to eat less processed food, to give them better food and better choices. But I think most districts are thinking about that. As a state, I don't believe we mandate that, but the districts make up their own minds. But we can help discuss that with them and lead them in that direction. And um, I, I just think it's time that you know, the obesity problem in children, the problems we have with, with, with poor eating habits and the type of food, which is quick and easy to eat. Does Zusha have one? Does Zusha have a farm school program? They do not. We have applied, but it's it's a little, it's more of a process of getting into that. But you know, I went to battle with Sedex so many years ago and yes. didn't get very far. I didn't either. Because there's no competition with the Medford District and yeah. Sedex, so they always renew their contract. So it's a. It, Good luck with that one. I, you know, we have a farm right outside our school. I wish we could serve in our cafeteria, but there's a liability. So is that is that a Medford School District requirement then? The already contracts. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, if we can help, let us know. Thank you. I, I can give you a, a little insight into that. Um, to this gentleman's question. Um, the Medford Schools Foundation um, made a $250 grant to the Medford School District to print literature, which allowed a 200, I don't know if it was 100,000, or I can't remember whether it's 100,000 or a $250,000 grant from the Department of Agriculture to fund fresh fruits and vegetables. And so if you print the literature from another entity, uh, funded by, by another entity, which the Medford Schools Foundation gladly did. It's the best leverage grant I've ever heard about in my whole life. And the Medford School District um, got either $100,000 or $250,000 worth of USDA monies to buy uh, fresh fruit and vegetables for the Great. whole district. Great. So I know that there's an effort to do all that. Yeah, um, well, and I that's going changing. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely it's definitely changing. I know myself as a, as a beef producer have uh, sold beef to the Grants Pass School District, which is not a Sodexo. Uh, they mm -hmm. they do it all in house yeah. over there, and um, it's totally dependent on the school food service director. I mean, what their approach is. They if they are forward thinking and and there is money to buy local, which the state um, has has provided, and some of those funds have definitely accrued right down here to the local county level, and, and I was. Um, a beneficiary of that, I know, because she said we have a little extra money to buy local, and that's what we're going to do with it. So you see that kind of happen over the last seven or eight years. Well, that's definitely. Well, this that's is what it, saw it getting yeah, started. It's definitely happening. Right. So. The other thing that's happening is at least there's at least one CSA out there that, that with the vegetable boxes that are that are, are uh, providing them to the employees at the Asante Health uh, the hospital, there. and I think when a lot of the parents who are who are getting it through their start getting it through their employers, mm. and they will also want it for their children. So I'm yeah. hopeful that that might actually be kind of a top-down thing. Yeah. It's sort of a re-education process. Yeah. Other questions? We're easy tonight. It's <laughs> early. <laughs> it's early. Three hands go around. <laughs> I'm going to talk to yeah. 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 This is going to be late. Um, I'm going to give you sort of my overview of it and why we did what we did. And then, Peter, you may want to get some more numbers on it. Basically, we had a situation where uh, we had put together a program. Let's put a lot of money into it from some other source that was not going to be long term sustainable. Mainly the money match and the hearing to the 8%. Uh, and I won't go into the details of that, but the cost will far ahead of what we pay out the benefits. And when you look at that, you have to make a decision. Do you want to uh, keep those programs going at the, at the cost of cutting services, larger classrooms, and whatnot? Or can you find somewhere in between that you can maybe balance this a little bit and, and, and make it sustainable long term without really hurting? seriously hurting people who have worked hard, worked for benefit, were guaranteed a benefit, may pay, pay, pay cuts or not taking pay increases, and keep them reasonably hold while you get this thing through to where it's going to be something that's sustainable. 
So we spent two different sessions working on this. Um, very difficult decisions to make. Um, and at the end, I think we, we put together a compromise that along with the improved economy, I think is going to get us through this difficult time and put us on a solid base for the next 30 years. What we basically did this last time after the first PERI report back in 2003, when we set up a tier three and did some other things. We said we were, we were going to hold down the COLA, the cost of living increases, for uh, a limited period of time. This can be changed for people making a very high income on retirement, 60, 70, 80, 100,000. And for people at the lower end, we were give them a little lower COLA, but at the really low end, making 20, 30,000 a year on retirement, we would give them a stipend to make up some of that. That sort of resets the whole program as you go forward in a way that hopefully we're not going to terribly hurt people at the low end. People in the upper end will feel a little bit of a push down, but not badly. But more importantly, it will maintain the whole system so that our future teachers and other workers won't be looking at a workload that's impossible to manage. And so, in a broad sense, that's what we did. There were proposals to do uh, things much, much more um, uh, draconian than that, that that I couldn't go along with. Uh, everything from ending PERS as we know it, which I think is first off not constitutional, but wanted to be done, um, and punishing people in some way for having a, a decent retirement system. <laughs> I wish everybody had a, a reasonable retirement system. We don't. Many people got wiped out in the last 10 years and don't see any way of retiring for the next extra five or 10 years, especially people in the 50s and 60s got hurt. So we're trying to balance all those things, what the public wanted, what we tried to do, and I'm hoping what we did was hit a con it is reasonably fair and acceptable, it may not be some people, but reasonably fair and acceptable, which will sustain the system. And as long as investments maintain themselves in a reasonable way, we should be okay. But we can't forget that we lost a huge amount of investment money, not just the fact that the stock market came back up, but the money you would have made during those years is gone. And you can't get that back. So that's what we're trying to do. Peter, do you want to say some more about yeah, that? Th th this was the hardest thing I've ever experienced in, in, any, in any field I've been in or in, really in legislature. And Bates, uh, I think, described very well. We were faced with making a decision uh, uh, do we try to restructure somehow and have an impact on an older generation in mm -hmm. order to try to provide services for current teachers and students and others involved in the work receive services and agencies. It was wretched. It was, just, it was a wretched puzzle to try to solve. Legally, it was a wretched puzzle. I spent uh, more of that. Are there any attorneys here? Uh, I, I spent more hours with attorneys than I ever want to spend, ever again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, going, going over the, 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 the Supreme Court decisions on PERS, and then there's, there's the moral decision. Yeah, I tried to use my next door neighbor as my, uh, as my kind of guide, and he, he taught in Jackson County Schools for 30 years. And uh, he has a decent retirement. He makes about forty thousand dollars a year in retirement. Uh, but he worked for many years on on virtually nothing. I mean, he had he had food stamps in his early career, mm -hmm. trying to take care of his family. So I'm trying to say, well, here's my neighbor. He's seventy years old now. He worked for thirty years. He has about forty thousand dollars retirement. I am now going to be cutting his cost of living adjustment in order to try to keep teachers employed, keep schools going, etc. Deal with the next generations. Um, so I consulted him a lot. On, on what we we're doing. And as Bates described it very well, what we end up trying to do is thread the legal needle to the best of our ability. The courts should decide this this sometime this year we'll get the decision uh, whether, we, whether we are legally uh, capable of doing this. And we, the, once we had the legal approach we felt was the, the right way to go, at least the, the, the solid way to go, we tried to figure out how do you structure it so that retirees on a lower level have the least amount of impact uh, to, to the retirement. Um, and we did, as they said, we set up a supplemental check program from the PERS Reserve so that lower income retirees, someone who's making 15000 or 18000 in their retirement, their cost, they'll still, they will still get a cost of living that rolls up uh, every year to help keep them solid, uh, but they'll also get a supplemental check to, to mitigate some of the loss they're taking because we're getting a smaller uh, cost of living adjustment. We also put provision in that in six years, uh, this will be reviewed to see if uh, the system has uh, stabilized. 
and whether the court upheld it and it was stabilized. Right now, the difference is that uh, we have stabilized the system. It's now 87% paid for. Uh, it's, it's back to being one of the most uh, uh, sound retirement systems in the country uh, at 87%. Uh, we have very good returns on investments in the past year. Um, and going forward, the employer rates, the rates that school districts and other employers pay, are level. Um, they're going to go up, they're going to tick up slightly, and every school district's different. So, Memphis School this might be this way, Phoenix Talent might be that way. But it's a very slight variation. If the court overturns what we did, the purse rates will go up about 5 to 6% in the next year, which would put us back in a situation where no matter what we invest in K 12 in this next budget, we will still be cutting school days or, or cutting programs. So we're still in a kind of that rough area, but there really is, in, in my work on it, in my view on it, there is, there's nothing else we can do. If the court overturns it, it is done. And and what you, what you can do is with current, the, the reforms that are done in 2003, the tier three, and everyone's been hired since 2003, that's a sustainable retirement system. That's an easily sustainable retirement system for the state. Because they, the, the people hired in 2003 get a much smaller benefit package. You could still adjust that benefit package. You could say, you know, we're going to adjust your individual account, or we're going to adjust what you can pay in. But those are small changes that are not going to have a significant impact either on the per system overall or on the state project. Just out of curiosity, where are the politicians now who set up that unsustainable? Guaranteed 8% a year. Where are the politicians who set up that unsustainable program and burdened Oregon taxpayers in effect forever? They um, wanted to give them some, some cover, some defense. Uh, I actually did have one uh, legislator come in and had coffee with me in, in Ashland and apologize. Uh, he, he said that I'd I like to check with some, my apology. But, <laughs> In, in uh, if you go if you track back the history, a lot of these things that the decisions got made, and based on the school board, you can tell you how that went for his school board. Sometimes the decision got made of saying, "Hey, if we make this change in PERS, which at the time didn't have much of a cost to it, they can hold down salaries, you know, significantly." So basically, trade off: boost your retirement, we're going to hold down your salaries, and that was a trade off that was made continuously. At the time, I don't think anybody foresaw it; wasn't projected. Out the way that it actually ran out to be. So I know, to my knowledge, no one made a conscious decision of saying, I know we're going to screw the city of Oregon over in 20 years. That wasn't a conscious decision, but that is the consequence of the decision that they made year after year after year in their struggles to try to balance out. They basically said to, to public employees, we're going to boost your retirement in exchange for holding down your salary. So what lesson are we going to try to learn from that so they don't repeat that same mistake in a different venue? Well, the legal systems were made in the 70s, 80s, like we just spoke to. We now do something differently they didn't do in those days, and I don't want to you know, blame them for this. I don't even know who they were. I never met them, don't know who they are. Um, we now look at 10 and 20 year scenarios of the future. We don't look at the, we do look, of course, the next biennium and focus on that, but we look down the road. Where are we really going to be in 20 years with these costs? Where, where is healthcare costs going? Where are education costs going? And, and what is our expected revenue to balance that out? If they did that kind of looking in the 70s, 80s, they would have seen this as unsustainable. I went up for the first time in 2001, and, and I was working, I started off working in the budget where I stayed. And as soon as I got into the PERS thing, and I'm not an actuary, I just looked at the, the payouts versus the funding for it. And this is before the recession. I said, this is not sustainable. This can't possibly be sustainable. The PERS board during the 70s and 80s got bad advice. They accepted that. They didn't have an outside source looking at it with them like we do now. They didn't have what called call LFO, legislative financial office, wasn't there then. We have that in place now, so we have checks and balances to look at these things. I'm not saying it'll never happen again, because it could. I mean, there's corporations that go on they're not looking for enough down the road. But we no longer are Robin Peter for pay Paul and kicking up a financial problem down the road for the next generation to take care of. We pay as we go in this state, we don't run deficits, we hold down our bonding, we're responsible about the money, and we've done that over the last 10 years, including for the first time setting up two, emer uh, two rainy day funds, emergency funds, that never was done in the 70s and 80s, 90s, when they had plenty of money to do it. We have two rainy day funds now. They're not as big as they should be, but they're growing. 
Because you know we're going to have a recession again someday. I don't care what the financial people say. It's probably within the next five, six, seven years. Mm -hmm. We want to have a couple of billion dollars of money when that happens. So we have got schools and everything else. One thing to add to that too, and we have, we restored our bonding rating to we have the next to the top bond level uh, that you can get for a state. The reason we don't have the top level is the kicker. Uh, the, the basically, we're the only state that has the kicker, and the bonding agencies tell us we're double A plus, we'd be triple A if we didn't have the kicker. The kicker does not allow us to build those rainy day funds up to a level that we need to. I mean, the, we're an income tax state, I, I don't want to bore you guys with stuff, but we're an income tax state. To my, my work on the budget, I passionately we need to get 10 to 15 percent of our general fund budget, the equivalent in a rainy day fund. That's what we have to have because we're income tax state. But when, when the recession hit, we just plummeted it because when unemployment goes up, that the income tax goes down, and it just wiped us out. But we, we, we need to build the rainy day fund up to 10 to 15 percent. So we're working on that. Yeah, right. And so last session I spoke with both of you because I am a long-term state employee. I've been working for about a quarter of a century um, as a scientist for the state. And I'm getting to that point where I'm ready to retire. And I was looking at what was happening to PERS proposals, and they were devastating. I'm, I don't get a do-over. And you're absolutely right. The salaries for state employees and government employees in Oregon are very low compared to the private sector for trained people like scientists and other professionals that I, I believe in public service, as you do. And I, I love your priorities. I think they're right on. But I'm going to ask, if this court case doesn't go the way that you think it's going to go, if it goes down, please don't find another creative way to do something funky to PERS and people who are going to retire or who are retired who don't get a do-over. I, I really ask that. And, and, you know, we, we receive so many. I, 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 I try to, to answer every phone call and talk to everybody, that, you know, because I have people who are, you know, 78, 79 years old Absolutely. saying, this is what it means to me. You're yeah. taking dollars away from me. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's very good. I think we all feel like this. I don't know what hear about first. <laughs> <laughs> if, this, if this program fails, legally, there's nothing else that can be done. And I don't think that puts me over that. And so we'll wait and see what the court says. And I'm hoping that people like you, if, this, if it is a fellow by the courts, that you'll still have enough retirement and you can work in a comfortable fashion. And we're not going to my kids. There you go. Well, my kids are with me. So they, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. well, can you speak to the environment and sustainable energy and, and what's being put forward in the state and the counties? Um, I wish you asked me that question about a week and a half after I met with the Energy Trust for a couple hours this week. I believe that one of the one of the biggest issues facing us, and may and may look at fifty years to hundred years from people may look back at us and say, the real issue was not all the things we talked about here tonight, although they do apply to it, but the real issue is global is global warming and, and, and global climate change. That might be the big issue of our time. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it's, you know, sitting in air conditioning, it's 100 degrees outside, and last night we had 14 forest fires burning. Um, but I, I think that's probably correct, that that's our biggest issue. And the way I look at it, it's just, just me, is we need to make a transition to more green, but you can't just flip the switch and make it happen. This air conditioning we're enjoying tonight didn't come off all the windmills in Northern Oregon, <laughs> um, which it did. It didn't come out of all the dams up there, which it did. Um, but it, it, a lot of it's still coming from coal plants in Utah, which we need to close down the coal. We need to transition into uh, gas plants. Uh, it's, it's a clear fuel, it's more efficient. And while we're making that transition over the next 10, 15, 20 years, and it's going to take that long, we have to get serious about getting off fossil fuels and, um, and other fuels that will work for us. Um, and that includes, in my mind, you know, wind, it includes uh, conservation of energy, which mm -hmm. we don't do a very good job of. It includes um, getting off of all the fuels we can, although we'll still have some we'll have to use. Getting cars that are more efficient or getting into, you know, uh, electric cars driven by electricity, non fossil fuels. So we're going to work our way towards that. Uh, we had a program called the Betsy going on for a long time. It got a little carried away, um, and we had to close it down a bit. We were here just that carried away. But I, I think programs like True South and others that we have here in the Valley are saying, 
we want to set up a program, we'll come to your house and put you on solar power. Uh, we'll come to your house and make you more energy efficient through uh, our power companies. Those programs just incrementally working and working and working and do that to make things there is, happen. Is there any conversation on the state or local government level, or is it all just coming from this? This is stuff, so the things I'm just saying are state issues. I didn't talk about federal. These are state issues, state, <coughs> state programs we have set up for tax incentives and for people moving to a more efficiency in their homes and, and more efficiency in their cars. These are local things. You know, we, put, we put together power stations up and down I-5 to put electric cars into. Mm -hmm. Not many states have done that. And I think the technology will get us there in time, but we have to keep working hard at it, keep pushing hard at it. We'd be realistic that for, for some time we're going to have to hang in and we've got what we make the transition. And don't use that as an excuse for not moving forward. Mm -hmm. That's just to get us there. And I like the first thing I like to see this country do is close the, power, the coal power plants down. The amount of pollution they put out is really amazing. We need to lead the rest of the world in this. Yeah. I like to see the West Coast go to some form of a system where we really are working with British Columbia, Washington, California, and our state, put incentives in place to show the world we can do this. Most of the pollution is not coming from us. You know, I mean, a lot of it is, but what's happening in the developing world in China and many other places is really important, and we've got to work with them to make those changes. Well, then how do you feel about gas exports and coal exports overseas? I feel coal exports are going in the wrong direction. I still think that I see gas as a transition. You've got to have some way of meeting de demand while we go into the green. The green are we helping by exporting it? I think when you see what's going on in Ukraine and other places, you might say we are. Okay, it's a very complicated situation. Europe is still dependent on the gas from Russia. And you can see the kind of problems we have because of it. Okay. Is Wayne, is Wayne, Wayne, you start the Clean Energy Works uh, Oregon program that we have funded with $10 million into it, and there's a Jackson County uh, proponent of that. He has some debate said it's a conservation program. Actually, as a homeowner, you can go to this program and you can have your house retrofitted at no upfront cost to yourself. Uh, so you can save your dollars, and those dollars pay off the cost of getting it done. It's a really good program. We have a clean fuel standard, very important for 2015. It sunsets in 2015, but it is our goal to work for a state to have clean fuels, so we're cutting down our emissions going forward. Uh, the program ends in at, at the 2017, is it? 2017. So, so it has to get renewed this next session, but we are making progress on that. So. I'm going to stand up so you can hear me okay since I'm in back. My comment kind of dovetails off of hers a little bit. It's about environment and economy. Um, I kind of wrote it down so I can speak clearly. So September 3rd, this September 3rd, marks the 50th, 50th anniversary of the Wilderness Act. And um, it was, has successfully protected millions of acres of important wildlands over that 50 years. Locally, we have um, a need to make additions to the Red Buttes Wilderness, which is at the headwaters of the Applegate River. And uh, statistics from Headwaters Economics show that counties that have the most protected land designate, designated under some kind of protected status have a higher per capita income. My question to both of you is, how do we grow the recreational economy based on protected ecosystems that can help the economy of Southern Oregon and the Applegate specifically? Um, right now, the BLM is proposing the Ned's Bar timber sale in the Little Applegate and Upper Applegate. This will just uh, set us back on creating the healthy and, eco and intact ecosystems that the Applegate needs to thrive. You know, people move here because yeah. it's beautiful. Just going to yeah. ask real quick, Dixon, to start with you. And this is so frustrating because the Applegate, uh, with the knitting circle and everything that the Applegate has done to show sustainable forestry practices, we brag about the Applegate all the time and say, we both stand on our yeah. second floor. Yeah. And we talk about, look how we're doing the Applegate. That's what we're doing statewide. So I'm, I'm sorry to see BLM, BLM is, is moving away from that kind of inclusive, uh, sustainable uh, forestry practice. Uh, and uh, Bates talked a little bit about the section dredge mining on the road issue as well, which is he has, he has uh, been at the forefront of that ever trying to protect our rivers. You, your point about our economic health is, is well taken. Uh, I think we both know, and I think all of us know, how vital this place is uh, to our economy. And if we don't have this, you know, the, you know the, my wife works at the Shakespeare Festival. Shakespeare Festival is, is successful because it's great work, but it's also because of where it Location. is. And people want to come here. They want to see a play and go down on the river, and they want to come to the Applegate and drive through and go, wow. Mm -hmm. You know, it's what it is. Thank you. Um, I'll start by kind of a high level. I don't think business and jobs and environment 
for conflict. I think they go they go together. If you have a strong environmental sense and you have a great environment, jobs will come to it. Uh, so I don't think they're contrary to each other. If you don't think about that too long, look at Eastern Europe and the Iron Curtain came down and they, the entire part of Eastern Europe had been destroyed you know, from an environmental point of view and they're now trying to put it back together. It's taken them 30 years and they're still cleaning up messes there. And they're still suffering because of that. So I think it's a mixture of those things that can work together and, and they actually complement each other and then them properly. Um, I have a real concern, I'm going to use my words carefully here, Anybody here from the BLM right now? I'm, 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 I'm going to hear about this. But I, have a, I have a real concern about the management of the BLM. I, I just I don't quite get where they're going sometimes. Um, and, it, and it seems to me the Forest Service does, does a better job at it with working with people and, and trying to thin the forest. Uh, Pull down the risk for wildfire, developing uh, a more places for people to recreate in um, and, and enjoy the things around us. I really think there's a balance here that can be, be met. And I'm just not sure the BLM quite gets there on this thing. And, and I've always been confused why you know, we have tracks of forests, one controlled by BLM and one controlled by National Forest Next Door. It makes no sense to me. And, and, and this is a federal issue. We talk to our federal people. With, it's up to me, and it isn't up to me, but up to me, I would start putting tracks of forests that are co-joined under the Forest Service, mm -hmm. get the BLM out of it, and, and, and again, it's a breaking down of silos, mm -hmm. and, and really be careful to listen to the local people, what they want locally, all the local people, so what they want locally, and try to make this thing work better. Um, and it's, it's very frustrating, because people come to me and ask those questions, I have to explain to them, I don't go to Washington, D.C., I go to Salem, and, I don't have that kind of control, but I, I have a little bit more insight from when you're talking to why you're in Berkeley. But um, still, it's tough. And then when you get to talking about these issues, you realize um, that the federal government really is not functioning right now. I'm not saying dysfunctional, they're just not functioning. They like, just barely can keep the government running. It's, a, it's really more of an issue that I think we, we believe in our country. The polarization between Republicans and Democrats, far right and far left, or right and left, has gotten so bad that we don't talk to each other anymore. We don't even live together anymore. Our neighborhoods are segregated by who you are, and that's not good. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to talk to each other. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a huge problem. I'm not sure I've got a good answer for it, except to say that we will continue to talk to people at the federal level and try to bring home to them that they're going in the wrong direction down here locally and that, that we'd like to see change. Thank you. I'm gonna, anybody who has not had a chance to have a question answered, we're gonna get to them first. Thanks. So this is a this is obviously a federal issue with the BLM lands, but recently the report on the 2013 timber harvest was released. And something like 80% of that harvest in Jackson County came from private industrial timberlands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a large portion of that were clear cuts, which are not recommended for this particular biological region. The greater percentage of that timber did not go to local mills. It went to Coos Bay and went overseas. Can you do anything at the state level to level that playing field so that local people have a chance to run some mills and keep that product here at home. There's, there's a proposal by Representative Paul Holby from Eugene that I co-sponsored. We couldn't dig get traction on it. It's going to take a little time, I think, for it to sink in. I think everybody wants what you're talking about. Everyone's going to let's keep our logs here, let's mill them here. And uh, Holby's proposal, if DeFazio backs it, thinks it's a very good idea, it's basically shifting around the tax advantages so that the tax advantages would not go towards export, the tax advantages would go towards milling here, keeping it here. There are winners and losers anytime you make that kind of shift. And uh, what we proposed was basically let's make that shift to get a tax credit, keep mills here, and give part of the revenue to the counties that are hurting so badly. You know, the, the you know, I would say Jackson, Josephine, uh, create, we, we can do this. However, the knee-jerk reaction from the timber industry was, leave us alone, we like it the way it is, don't mess with us. 
I get that they're, they've got a good thing going. So it's going to take a lot of political will, I think, to, to get the votes to say, you know what, you're still going to make a lot of money, but we're going to keep more of it here. We're going to keep more of it here. They're going to have to possibly adjust on that. Yeah, we couldn't even have, that was one that, you know, and then we can usually get our bills, uh, you know, heard, we can usually get things moving. That was one where you could barely get a hearing on it because of the opposition to it, because people are afraid of uh, that, that change. But we have to do, we have to do it. Uh, the governor made a speech in the Florida Convention Center that I was at, and he made that line up, we're going to keep Oregon long here home. The whole audience stood up and applauded, yay, yay, it's kind of like, okay. Do you really want to do it? <laughs> but doesn't it mean that everybody here is the taxes go up just a little bit because it's actually more expensive to do it here than it is overseas? And, and so everybody says, let's do that. Let's all vote for jacking our taxes up just a bit. This that's, would be, that's the problem. This it? would actually, well, it, would, it, would, it would basically lower the profit uh, on the different companies. It would. Uh, they, they would. They would see a little bit less profit because they, they get a tax right now, they get tax breaks for their business operations, and we're basically saying to them, you're not going to get these, these tax breaks. So 70% so of the timber comes out of the south, and those companies would say, oh, good. Yeah. And, and, and their, their product's better. I mean, it's a balance that it's goes on all the time. And, yeah. and Oregon has to compete against the south, and, and uh, so. And uh, sure, yeah. other places. Absolutely. There might be ways to do it. We <coughs> have yeah, talk about some more. One of the things I want to look at in the next session is, um, and I've been reading about this over the last couple of months, we have a, a basic forest act here about how, how much how you log, how you communicate, how close you go to, to watersheds and streams. And the state of Washington actually has stricter regulations than we do, which kind of struck me as a surprise because they're not as dry as state, and um, they don't have the kind of issues we do with water, you know, but they do obviously fire right now. But, um, not as not as much as we normally have, and I think we need to you know, look at that forest practice effect. We haven't looked at it in a long time. Maybe mm -hmm. time to take a good look at it and see what's really doing what we want to do, and why is Washington's I would say stricter than ours is. Think about it. Mm -hmm. Bravo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good um, well, as a member of Rogue Fly Fishers, I do want to thank you for your oh, work on yeah. the, um, dredging and getting that the laws changed here. Um, my question has to do with uh, the marijuana initiative, uh, you know, basically legalizing it for recreational uses, how that integrates with state, the federal law, the effect on state law, the law, law enforcement, you know, as an employer, as an employer, drug testing, you know, I'm, a, I, I'm somewhat regulated under some federal Right. Guidelines in my yeah. occupation. So. Yeah. Those federal guidelines, I'll take the last question, those federal guidelines would stay the same. I mean, if you had a federal contract and the contract required a drug free workplace, that would still stay, stay the same. They, uh, it would not be, if you were doing drug tests for your employees, they could not test positive for marijuana, even if it was legal in the state of Oregon. That would still be the same. There are signs the federal government is changing. I don't know if you, you saw last month, Congress. Congress actually voted for this. Uh, in that the, the House of Representatives, they, they voted um, to not spend any uh, target of uh, drug enforcement dollars on states that are following their own state laws on marijuana. So, I mean, there was, was a big shift for you know, it was a bipartisan bill that passed in Congress. Um, so, that they basically are using their funding authority. There's the discussion, too, that the, um, the law administration might reschedule marijuana from substance one to substance two uh, on the Control Substance Act, which would also start that process of toning down the, the, the severe restrictions on it. The measure, the New Approach Oregon measure qualified for the ballot, I encourage you to read it. Uh, they tried to take the best of the lessons they can from Colorado and from Washington uh, to actually how to set up a, an Oregon program for recreational marijuana. Uh, in a nutshell, if you look at our microbrew industry, that's kind of their model. These guys who have an approach to Oregon, they're saying, can Oregon have a kind of micro marijuana industry? Uh, if that's the approach they're going to take. Um, There's one on my uh, street already. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and that's, if you know, I can talk for, for way too long on this, but on the medical marijuana uh, side, we've both been trying to professionalize that system for a long time. Mm -hmm. And the dispensaries is part of trying to professionalize that so they actually are a business, they're transparent, they're safe, and they don't disrupt mm -hmm. communities or neighborhoods. Growing is the next spot of that. Even if this thing doesn't pass in November recreational, 
I do want to try to work on legislation to, to now start to regulate growers so we're not having neighborhoods disrupted by grow mm -hmm. sites. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's, that's acceptable to have. Uh, and I want to have people that, that, that grow marijuana well to be licensed and be able to provide safe marijuana for the marijuana system. So that's something I really want to work on. It, I do think the recreational measure will pass. I think the, the, the approach to recreational measure will pass. So I encourage you to read it. If you have questions on it, let me know what those questions are. Because uh, it is a, a kind of brand new industry that's starting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do think that Oregon passes it, and Alaska has it on their ballot as well. I think the tipping point will be reached in terms of the national prohibition will start to fade away. Well, I'll just make a couple quick comments. If you want to read it, 75 pages, I've read it. Okay, and I had to go back and mark things. It's really complex, but it's been actually pretty well. It looks like legislation more than a ballot yeah. measure. Yeah. Uh, and it's not constitutional, so we can, we can work and change it. Um, my approach to this is going to be pragmatic. The fact is that the majority of Americans now think it's okay to smoke marijuana recreation. Whether you like that or not like it, whether you're opposed to it or whatever, that's what it is. And that number is growing every year, and it's going to continue to grow every year. It's probably close to 60% now nationally. It's going to be 70 80% pretty quick, and it's going to happen. So let, let's just face the fact it's going to happen, and now let's start dealing with it. And that's what we're trying to do in this state. And uh, the work you did in the dispensaries, I supported. Um, I think of one of my best friends who lives in Talent. Uh, she and her family have a, a guy next door who has a couple of uh, big mean dogs out there all the time on chain in the front yard. People come and go in all night. Um, things show up like boats all of a sudden out of nowhere and, you know, they get sold later. Um, the kids can't go outside. All they can smell is this marijuana this guy has and grows and dispenses from his house. That He's got about 300 medical marijuana cards that he uses. And you know, it's a mess. And her, her neighborhood is rude. If she wanted to sell her house right now, she could. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got to stop that kind of stuff. Put them in dispensaries. Make it a legitimate business where it's supervised and run properly. We have to have growers that are run and, and, and controlled. In the Netherlands, uh, to be a grower, you have to have inside a greenhouse, and these greenhouses are very mm -hmm. large. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't disrupt other people, most people around them. It's, it's time to grow up about this and deal with it in a way that, that it's reasonable. Um, and it's, it's no longer like marijuana is a bad thing or a good thing. It's just you got to be pragmatic and do something about it. And that's our responsibility, I think, as legislators, to do those kinds of things and get it done in a reasonable fashion. So uh, we're going to move forward in this. I think it's going to pass, and we're just going to have to deal with it in a way that's reasonable. You can pick some names out. Yeah, I'm just wondering uh, what you see the potential uh, agricultural sector benefits being to the economy from the passage of 15119. When we look at you know Marin's history over 10 years and their switch to their you know rapid switch to organics and from grass seed to so many other other uh, edible. Uh, Foods and boosting their economy. How do you how do you uh, anticipate we're gonna we're gonna fare? Uh, very positively. I mean, if you look at the experience of Vernon and Mendocino County, and you know, GMO free Mendocino County, GMO from Vernon, you know, they they are branding their products with that. They have no problems finding markets for their products. In fact, they they cannot produce enough for markets. You know, they like they the start by Amy's Kitchen and yeah. their, their desire for organic products, one of the reasons that they're here is access to organic organic products. I, I think that for Oregon, we already have our state already has a reputation. You know, if you travel when you travel around people who, who have heard of us, uh, you know, <laughs> they, you know they, they explain, you know, where are you guys from? We're, we're above California they get that. <laughs> but but if they have heard of us, they believe we are this State. They, believe, they believe that we're, we're good on energy. They believe, yeah, well, you guys are at the forefront of clean energy. And we've done a lot of good stuff in clean energy here at the forefront. And, 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 and our agricultural products, they assume our agricultural products are organic and that they are, you know, the, the, the best, you know, the, the yeah. high quality stuff. Yeah. So I think this is going to actually, for Jackson County, it's going to get Jackson County a great boost. And when I mentioned earlier my desire to try to get the organic industry more organized, so it is is active in our world in the capital. They don't exist. Organic industry doesn't exist. So when ag issues come up, it's it's you know, something like me talking. And I'd much rather have you know 
uh, the friends and family farmers talking. I'd much rather have you know 60 farmers from the Land Valley come and testify instead of Bates and me testifying. I mean, it's just much more effective. So I really want to get that done. I think it's going to be a great advantage to our company. I think it's going to be huge too. Uh, I, I don't think we've quite realized what we've done here. Uh, it's such a shocking thing and, and wonderful thing to pass that initiative. Uh, people I know in the Capitol and people representatives and senators locally in this county, in Josephine County, who were so vehemently against the initiative uh, and felt we were just doing the absolutely wrong thing or shocked that it passed in the past in the big election. Uh, it's really a vindication of what local people can do. Uh, I think that the future for it's huge because it's we don't know because we're just getting started. I mean, all of a sudden now we're going to be the only GMO county, you know, GMO free county in the state. I think it's going to open a lot of stuff up. And I'm also concerned that up in the Lima Valley, which is the really huge agricultural center, they're they're going the wrong direction. They are likely they're risking their seed industry up there by allowing canola to go in. And one of the big arguments up there at the time was that the ag department can take care of this. I sat down with Katie Cola, who's the you know, head of it, and the agency. She and I had a, we've always gotten along very well in the last 10, 12 years. She and I had a really nasty meeting about it for about half an hour, and she finally slammed her book down left and just left in a huff. I said, I don't think you guys are capable of doing this. I don't think you've got the people to do it. And, I'm right. and, I, and I don't think you can. I don't think you can legally do it. And I don't think you you can keep the canola seeds from blowing into the rest of it. And she just slammed her book down left. And then afterwards, it's all over with. She says, you know, I guess we don't have the legal right to do that. And we can't map it. We don't know what we're going to do now. You know, it, it's that kind of stuff that really concerns me. If they ruined the seed industry up there, we got a huge crop down here. Uh, they did. They ruined the seed industry in Europe. They lost their entire seed industry up there because over in Europe because of it all. Mm -hmm. So the opportunities here are huge, but we're going to have to hold the fort. I think going to come back after us in the courts or some other way, trying to get, get it knocked down. But I think we, I think we can hold out. I think we can win this one. And the future is very well. Do you see it being a state uh, ban on on growing any time in the next twenty years? There's, a, I think there's interest, again, it, 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 I've never experienced anything like this, going back up the Capitol after the May primary, and everybody that saw it, how the hell that happened? You know, and people say, Jackson and Josephine both voted for it, and people ask him, do you think voters statewide would? And my answer has always been, Jackson votes yes, Josephine votes yes, Lane's going to vote yes, Multnomah's going to vote yes, mm -hmm. and Schutz is probably going to vote yes, mm -hmm. we'll just pass the statewide ban. Mm -hmm. I, I think what more likely is what's going to happen now is that uh, we're going to go back and fight again on giving local people the right to vote for their own future mm -hmm. on this. Uh, the One of the arguments that was used mm -hmm. why we had to have a statewide preemption on a local vote was that farmers would be too confused, which I always love that idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and, and that, 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 that basically if a farmer had property in two different counties, they wouldn't know which county restrictions to follow. Uh, okay, so uh, <laughs> one proposal that I'm going to make uh, at a bill to go forward in 2015 is say, okay, if a county wishes to vote on a ban, a farmer who's currently using GMO crops as of a certain date is grandfathered in. If they have the property in two different counties, so they're not confused, you know, to, to try to get rid of that argument across. But I think there's strong interest in it. It's going to see what happens with the labeling measure on the ballot. If a labeling measure passes, I think Oregon, the, if the momentum for Oregon to be GMO free mm -hmm. is going to, is going to I think the wheat farmers in Eastern Oregon have had a big scare. They're going to, they would vote for this too. Mm -hmm. um, they had a real big yeah. scare. Yeah. 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 Um, and I, I was interested in one of the debates we had at the Rotary. Invited the pro from Dover from UC Davis to talk about what happened in Eastern Oregon. And she basically said, she's a, a botanist and was working for Monsanto, said, We're sure that was planned there on purpose and it was, uh, you know, sabotage to make us look bad. Oh, yeah. Where's the proof? Yeah, proof? yeah and that's where the proof is. You know, I asked her, you know, it's, it's all Monsanto seed, it's proven by Oregon State, that's what Oregon State University is where it's from. Nobody can get a whole lot of stuff. You used it experimentally in Eastern Oregon, Eastern Washington. Obviously, some of it got loose. No, I don't think so. I think somebody stole yeah. it. Yeah. It makes no sense. Anyway, so anyway, thanks for the question. I think the future is very bright. And I'm looking forward to see what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. You know, you talked a lot tonight about, about um, uh, getting rid of silos and what things work here and what things work there. Among the other reasons, and there are a lot of them, 
why it passed here, other than, you know, if we want to do something, I'm going to kind of do it. And so <laughs> and a lot of people, people were very offended by the outside money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when something else comes up, if it's statewide GMO or something else, if we start smelling all that outside money again, it, it can be defeated. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. good, good point. I kind of like that. You know, I, think got, I think the GMO three people got outspent, what, two or three to one? And still one. You know, it, I mean, what you do on the ground here, we're a small enough community. We still talk to each other. We still work together. And we can make changes here that are really important to us. And I think it's going to be something important for the state and the country. That, that, through. that was the most exciting thing yeah. for the primary was the fact that, that as a community, we really focused on and worked on, mm -hmm. but also the, you know, the library, letting mm -hmm. in that pass, mm -hmm. and working on that and getting that pass for the next, or this generation, next generation. I think really great about that. Mm -hmm. It really, it says something about who we are. Now we got to revitalize uh, SOU. Uh, that's so important to our region, we need to revitalize that university and make sure it's a powerhouse. Mm -hmm. I'll go that was my question. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, boy, uh, yeah, we have five minutes left. Five minutes left. We have an hour vision. But Dar, no, no, here's yeah. quick comment. Um, the, the university system is breaking up. Right. You know, the yes. University of Oregon went out, and boy, this, that was an adventure too. Uh, the University of Oregon was going to go out. They had, a, and you probably might have seen the news recently, a two and a half billion dollar uh, bait in front of it saying, if U of O goes forward with its own board, uh, Phil Knight and others will dedicate two and a half billion dollars to endowment for U of O. And the, the, the argument that they make, I think, is the start, we haven't solved the problem as a state about how to fund higher education. Are we going to lose another generation while we, we dicker around and try to figure this out? That, that's a valid argument. There's still a lot of concerns, though, over a, a you know the, the composition of a board, but that board's moved to a public university. Are we still have access to our education? Are decisions being made in a way that's inclusive, etc.? So we battle with these issues all the way through. Bates has been on the on the uh, uh, the program for much longer than I about having a regional board for SOU. Um, I, I came out of this going, we got to protect SOU and the regionals on shared services and budget issues. And he kept saying, no, you got we have to have people uh, who are on the board of SOU who love SOU or devoted to our region to help build that, that thing. I am a convert. I am now 100% in that direction. Really have to deal with the State Board of Higher Education on a number of issues. Where we have people, we have people on the State Board of Higher Education who had never been on the campus, had never been to La Grande, had never been to Klamath Falls, and yet they're making statements about the regional universities that were absurd. And they would make them and vote on them, and you know, it was, it was appalling. It really was appalling. So we have a chance now. We have a chance to have our own board for Southern Oregon University, uh, made up of people here from business, from the arts, uh, from the community, to to be the guiding force of the board of that university. The new president, the interim president, really interesting guy, great instincts, and uh, he really gets it. Uh, the fact that we need to kind of revitalize uh, the communication uh, to and from and within the campus community. And I think that he's dedicated to getting that done and opening up doors and making sure people feel passionate about that university, recruit from the university. We, we are at a point right now, I, I believe, that we can start putting more dollars into those budgets again, so cutting them back, hold down tuition increases so that students aren't continuing to, to, to carry on these debts. But the real key for Southern and for Eastern is the next two years. If Southern and Eastern can show that we can stabilize the budget situation and recruit on a, on, a, on a sustainable level and have a mission that we all get behind and believe in and are moving forward with, I think the future is very bright. If we don't show that, we, have, we show we're very uh, likely to be swallowed up at Oregon State University and have decisions again made for our regional university by a board that's in the about. So that's the reality of what we're facing. And that was the best deal that we could work out was give the regions a chance. Give us a chance. Let us go after this. Uh, the governor is working with the university right now to appoint board members to nominate them. The Senate has to approve them. Uh, there will be uh, probably a slate of nominees in September for the Senate to approve of or not approve of, depending on how it goes. Uh, there will be a faculty member on the board. There will be a student voting member on the board. There will be a staff member on the board as well because uh, we want it to be an inclusive uh, uh, process for each one of the campuses. That's the local board. That's the local board, absolutely. So all seven universities now will have their own boards. And ironically enough, this is really strange, uh, but uh, even when they're all together, 
Uh, they didn't always work well together. Now that they're all going out their own boards, I've seen more cooperation in the seven universities in the last year than I've experienced in the So you want to add to that, yeah, Not much, just a couple things. Um, yeah, I, I was always dismayed uh, by the, how the higher ed board worked going back at least 10 years, and they make selections and decisions for us that we had no input in at all. Uh, who our president's going to be, all kinds of things. We were ignored. And I think a lot of decisions were bad decisions. I also felt that it, it made the, the regionals kind of disconnect from their communities. Yeah. Um, and, and we didn't mean to. It's just a natural thing that when, you're, when your boss is in Portland, you're going to be thinking of Portland more than you're thinking local. Uh, SOU is a vital part of our, of our community here. And it's not just for Ashland, it's for our entire community. And you had a time to be kind of kid about this moat and Bob wire up around SOU and they wouldn't talk to people in that group and so on and so forth. When we put that RCCSOU higher ed bill together in Medford, that was a big battle for us. And um, came down to the wire on getting that done. And you remember that story. Probably everyone backed out except Schrader and I. And I refused to vote for the budget. And our coach to vote for the budget for Dr. Williams put in. Mm -hmm. So that, that was the beginning of the breakdown of um, us versus them in the community. And we started working together in a more collaborative way. But I also think of it this way. Um, you got a campus sitting next to one of the great Shakespearean experiences in the United States, maybe in the world. You've got an incredible, beautiful climate there. You've got a community that is very progressive moving forward. It's in Austin or a Boulder. You know, you have this wonderful thing going on, and yet you seem to have difficulty recruiting students to your campus. OIT in Klamath Falls has a great group. <laughs> So we go up to Western, which is a great university, but it sits in the middle of Portland State and Oregon State and the University of Oregon, yet they seem to do pretty well. When I drive north from here, the first sign I see about a university is come to Western, and it's just you know, up there by Canyonville. And so just as sort of a funny thing going on here. We never really got vitalized and, and got things going. Um, I, I think we missed, missed that a lot of our students needed to be prepared for the workforce, and we didn't really do that. Uh, a lot of students came there because they wanted the experience going to college and having a liberal arts education. I think we did a pretty good job of that. Um, and some of them wanted to be getting into theater, and, and that, that worked well for them too. But we didn't, we didn't reach out to everybody the way we should have. We didn't market ourselves. About six or seven years ago, there was a there was an article about the 20 top small schools in the Northwest. 19 of them were private schools. We're talking, mm -hmm. you know, Whitman up in Washington, blah blah blah. There was one public school that was listed, the public ed university was listed in the top 20. It was Southern. I bet none of you heard about that. Mm -hmm. yeah, New, York, New York Times called it a hidden gem. A hidden yeah. gem. American and they didn't do anything with it. <laughs> they didn't do anything with it. And it was like. So I, I think we have to revitalize this thing and move forward. If you look, if you go on campus and see the new science wing that's going to go up, you see the uh, uh, library, you see things on campus happening that are there, the infrastructure is there, the great professors we have, the wonderful staff we have, I think they need to be led in a different direction and get this thing rolling. I don't know why we have about five, six, seven thousand students down there. I think we can do it, but we have to do a turnaround here as far as recruiting and showing what we can do what we have to offer. We have great value to offer there at Southern, and especially if we start doing a little more work in the sciences, a little more work in, um, mm -hmm. in the computer sciences, especially. So we're really so, motivated. So, so one quick comment. To give you the impression of how motivated I am to make this work, I know we both are to make this mm -hmm. work. The state board meeting, when they're talking about whether the regional should have their own boards, one of the state board members actually said, I don't know, giving the regionals their own boards, like giving a teenage driver the keys to the car. <laughs> and that, that was that was after Sid DeBoer and I had testified on behalf of Southern University with backing by Paul Nicholson, the Shakespeare Festival, et cetera, et cetera. That was the attitude from the state board. So if I got a chip on my shoulder, yeah, I got a chip on my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really want Essie to thrive, and I want to to walk back up through and how's it going, guys? <laughs> What's Portland State doing these days? <laughs> Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> not, it's not that personal. <laughs> the local board, I think, can do that. And I don't want that for 10 years. And so I'm really happy to see. I think it's a short time. So, so
So one of the thoughts on attracting teachers is to think about transforming the job that the teachers do. Because we pay them about 66 grand is the average, which is a fairly low number. And if you could just adopt a little productivity improvements, you could pay them 100 grand. And then all of a sudden, you'll have a stampede. And the way you do it in one sentence is you adopt what they do in the hospital. You have the, the, the teachers like doctors. The doctors don't change bedpans. And they don't, they don't grade third grade, grade uh, 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 math papers. They don't, aren't hall monitors. They don't do the x-rays you send them in. The doctors are the thinkers and the organizers. We've got magic machines called computers, which are information engines. And we are still with the same idea. It takes the labor, teacher labor hours of 50 years ago is what we do now. And that's why the, the salaries are low and why there's a constant crunch. It's just like the post office. You know, they're up against email and everything else. And they're, they're, they're going. So we've got to think differently about the way we we expect from teachers. We can expect more, and it can be wonderful, and it can make economic sense, and, and then you will have a stampede, believe me. That's, yeah. that's my rule. Okay. Who has so, not had a chance to speak or ask a question yet? One or two. You're a principal, I don't mind. We are. are. Yeah, but she's well, our principal. I didn't like the vice principal because he and I were always on a personal first name basis. Because he a lot of time in his office. <laughs> Well, first and foremost, I really want to thank you for your support. I mean, three years ago, we were struggling to keep the doors open, and with the amazing support of our community, and, and you two in particular, um, the three years from then, I think Roof School is doing an amazing job. We're up, our enrollment is up past 30%. Um, we are, because of an active uh, participant from my teachers, we're, we have about $40,000 in grants that we're going to be existing on next year. Um, our attendance stays up past 95%, even through the toughest times, like a strike. And we've successfully implemented a place and community-based philosophy that is service-oriented so that we can help make our community healthier. My one concern now, of course, is the Common Core. And mm -hmm. even though the standards, I, I'm a big fan of the standards. I think they're really going to accomplish some of the things that they were initiated for in the first place. My concern is, I've been in education for 25 years, Are we, that billion dollars that you're talking about, is that going to help fund this? And that once we've decided to go forward, that we're not going to in a couple of years go, oh, it's not working and let's start something else. And, and uh, you know, you hear of these states pulling out of the Common Core and the Smarter Balance having its issues. What, where are we at? Are we, are we committed? Are we strong? What's going on? Um, I had the uh, absolute pleasure when I was there. Tuesday. I've been to so many meetings I can meet tonight. But I had the absolute pleasure on Tuesday night to meet with about seven or eight teachers from the Metro School District. Um, because I, I've been reading a lot about Common Core, a lot of controversy, a lot of different directions on it. And if, if I don't get this right, please correct me, okay? I took about <laughs> four pages of notes. In, um, here was sort of where I think those teachers are, and they're very intelligent men and women. And the longer I listened to them, the more I, I really appreciate what they were telling me. One, um, they don't want to be the flavor of the day. They don't want to sit in cams, they don't want to cite, you know, cite counsel. I mean, I've been through all this with you, trust me, okay? No, don't trust me, you probably shouldn't, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they, they want a long-term commitment. You know, like a 10-year commitment. We're going to do this thing or we're not going to do this thing. Secondly, um, they want to slow the implementation down a little bit. They have not had a chance for the teachers to learn completely about this, develop the curriculum, and really be able to teach the students, not to the test, but teach the students of uh, what they need in this new, a new look at how you can go about this. Um, especially worrisome about mathematics from the point of view of how it's being taught, and especially the way it's being tested. There's real questions about that. There were real questions also about, um, I'll go back to my topic of children from a low socioeconomic status who come in 
And this testing is all going to can happen on computers, which goes back to what this gentleman was talking about. And that's a powerful way of testing people on a regular basis as they're doing using computers. But when you've got a class or a, a school, it's a Title I school, where those kids come in, have never been on a keyboard, have never been on a computer before, let alone try and teach them a new common core and pass a test, and they don't know what to do with the computer, you've got a problem. And some of the answers I understood that on the test were wrong. The answer was wrong for the question, and so those things have to be fixed too. So, what they're asking for, let's slow this thing down. We think it's wise to have a common core across the United States, it's wise to have a common core across the, across the state, but it's being implemented too fast with too much confusion. Slow this thing down over the next three or four years. Don't start telling a teacher you're a bad teacher because your kids didn't do well. Mm -hmm. Right now, basically, and I'll probably get myself in trouble for saying this, basically, I can predict how a particular school will do academically by its socioeconomic status. Mm -hmm. That's oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Roosh is a little bit an outlier. I'll give you that. Okay? <laughs> you are. A little okay, bit. We're a big outlier. outlier. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you have a very broad socioeconomic status and your children all do well, which tells me that there's something going on. Here. That's good. Community um, But they want to slow this thing down and, and, and get the tools we need. We need more computers right now. Just the testing alone is tying up all the computer labs so kids can't work on a computer and learn computer skills. This goes back to what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. We need more computers in the schools. That's to take money. Okay? We need to spread that knowledge to those computers better. Have kids get used to using computers in the first grade right on or earlier for all I know. This is my guy. I can barely work his iPhone, by the way. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's the kind of change that we need to make. So the message I got was we're willing to stay on board and we want a long-term commitment. We want this thing slowed down. We're not going to throw out a system like other states have done, but we want this thing slowed down, not because we aren't going to do it, but we need some time to make this huge adjustment. That's what I heard. Did I get it right? Uh, yes, um, and, and I think there, um, this is probably more personal, but I'm still concerned about the scope and prioritizing the scope at, at not just the local level, but a state. Statewide? Yeah. yeah. One of the good things I heard, but it was very disturbing to me too, is a teacher at uh, Jacksonville Elementary that has over a 20 year span developed a really great social studies program. I didn't give her permission to use her name, so I won't. But uh, I guess it's a great program. Medical school district looked at it and said, This is a really good program. Uh, we'll spread it through our schools. And other schools across the state are not picking it up. Well, I'm glad that's happening. And it's maybe become the curriculum for social studies in the second or third or fourth grade where she's in. I'm sorry, that's not the way it should happen. We should be getting help from the state down to all the districts, not one district here picking up something great and one over here something great, something great over here. And I'm not criticizing her. She's a wonderful teacher, you know, just a great teacher. Someone like her should be looked at and said, you know, you did this by yourself in your school at Spread Cross State. We're going to pull you out of that school because we need you in Salem. No. <laughs> 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 See, because I was just gonna, I was just gonna brag about my science teacher, but I'm not gonna do it anymore. Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they take a sabbatical. <laughs> Maybe they can work on weekends. Maybe that teacher is Rita Sullivan of Education in Jackson. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And Rita Sullivan has spread her program yeah. across the state through yeah. us. Yeah. Okay, that's the way it that's should be done. Client, I, mean. I just, I have concerns. Okay? And then I just want to, but thank you so much, and I appreciate your comments about, um, you know, everything's uh, connected because we've always thought that if you put more funding, the appropriate funding into education, you're going to take care of all these other issues that we might be experiencing. And then in passing, I just want to say that we just got the preliminary report for our school. We're one of the highest schools in Medford and the state. We should probably wrap up. Unless Gates have the last word here. Also, do, you know, do we need to, we need to put the chairs away afterwards? Yes. Okay. We'll do that. Okay. Um, if I just. Anyway, I'm sure we'll stick around out in the parking lot. They want to take us out if you have any additional questions. Uh, but just come to, I, I'm going to end by saying nice things. I, I have to say nice things about Rochelle High School. We're very proud to represent you. We're very you. proud to represent the school. Uh, so, so like I mentioned, talking about the, uh, the uh, 
timber harvesting out of game. We brag about Bush. And, and the fact that this community came together and it is an example of what can happen. We're, and I've told this story before, but one of the, the uh, most surprising things that happened to, with me in the budget work during the recession was we took the committee around the state, we went all over the state, and we had hearings all over the state, how people were talking about trying to hold their communities together, what they're trying to hold their communities together. And I, I finished doing those, those hearings around the state more optimistic about Oregon, even though we're in the midst of the recession, because I think there's something here in our state, people are willing to do it. You guys have crystallized it, though. You guys have crystallized in a way that's so clear that it's, it's a great thing to be able to say to other people around the state, look, this is what happens when the community comes together. The community can come together, they focus on their kids, they focus on what their kids need, focus on what the community needs, they can get it done. And it's not just a matter of resources, the resources are sure as hell help. And that's our, our job is to try to get you the resources to keep building, keep doing what you're doing. But, but what you've done here is, is something that's remarkable. It really is remarkable. So please keep it going. All of you that have helped that out, please keep it going. Don't stop. Take it further so that we can uh, use it as an example uh, around the state as well. <laughs> Uh, to, about what can happen if it comes together. It's really well done. So that's my nice thing to close off. Okay. <laughs> He's a thespian. I'm just here. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I, I want to thank you first for taking your time to come up for this evening. And we got a room full of people here who are, are really engaged in the community and engaged in what we're talking about. And for me, uh, to come here and listen to you and take that back to Salem is really important. Because that's more important than anything else I hear. And, um, and I appreciate you all being here tonight, taking your time to come here. I really mean that. Um, and we'll have many things we're doing, and I, I just want to make sure you understand. I do you understand you're taking a lot of time here, and I appreciate that. Uh, Rouge is a different type of place. It's different than it was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. I drive up here and see, you know, uh, wineries everywhere. <laughs> 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 that's thriving when people were trying to close you down 10, 12 years ago. A community that's really come together. Um, you've got John Peets out here, the problems out there that you kind of worked on. I think mean, there's a whole lot of, and I've spent a lot of time out here uh, coming, coming to venues like this one and listening and having a great time. Uh, and I really enjoy it. It's, it's fun to come here. I mean, people are basically very positive, they're thoughtful, you want to fix things. Um, there's some parts of the I go to that it's not kind of that way. It's kind of negative. And they keep wondering why they can't get their community to thrive and do better. Well, it's because the people there have lost that sense of community and the ability that you can make a difference. If you come together and work together, you can make a real difference. And you guys are showing that you can do that. So uh, congratulations to you. You're a wonderful community. Uh, we'll, Peter and I will keep coming up here every year. I'd like to come up more than once. You just <laughs> <laughs> but we'll come up and see you a couple times a year. Uh, tell us what you think. Uh, contact us anytime you want to. And, and uh, thank you for being in my district and thank you for supporting me. And uh, it's just been a pleasure representing representing you and help. But uh, we continue doing that. So thank you very much.